This presentation examines the two-sample F-test for variances. So first let's establish when it's fair to use these tests. The data sets must be simple random samples. We cannot make inferences about a population unless our sample is randomly selected. Secondly, the data sets must be independent. In particular, we cannot have the same individuals measured twice. Thirdly, the sets must be selected from normally distributed populations. In our discussion on the central limit theorem, we also had the situation where n could be large. That is not the case here. Regardless of the sample sizes, the sets must be normal. And if you would like to see some more discussion on the fairness of the F-test, you can check the link at the bottom of the slide. So here are some example null and alternate hypotheses that we can use for the F-test. Variance 1 equals variance 2 versus variance 1 does not equal variance 2. This is a two-tailed test. Variance 1 equals variance 2 versus variance 1 is less than variance 2. Of course, that would be a one-tailed test. Variance 1 equals variance 2 versus variance 1 is greater than variance 2. That, of course, is a one-tailed test. This one to the right and this one to the left. And as we've seen earlier, we can certainly subtract variance 2 from both sides. So our H0 could be variance 1 minus variance 2 equals 0 to give us an idea about how this could be used. Our F statistic will be S1 squared divided by S2 squared, or sample variance of the first set divided by the sample variance of the second set. Many textbook authors say that S1 has to be larger than S2. That's because that's how the tables in the textbook are organized that will not be necessary for us since we are using statistical computing. We will need to determine the degrees of freedom of the numerator and the degrees of freedom of the denominator. The degrees of freedom of the numerator, n1 minus 1, so whatever n corresponds to that s1 is n1. n1 minus 1 is our dfn, or degrees of freedom of the numerator. Similarly, degrees of freedom of the denominator, take the n that corresponds to s2, call it n2, and the degrees of freedom of the denominator will be and 2 minus 1. So here's an example, a two-tailed test, variance 1 equals variance 2 versus variance 1 does not equal variance 2, and we have some data. The x-bars are not relevant to this discussion. The n's are going to be important for defining our degrees of freedom. However, to continue, we must assume that these two samples come from normally distributed populations. Otherwise, it is not fair for us to use the F-test. So F is going to be S1 squared divided by S2 squared, 6.3 squared divided by 5.1 squared. And that number comes out to 1.526. Our degrees of freedom of the numerator, so 6.3 corresponded to this N, 23 minus 1, 22. And the degrees of freedom of the denominator corresponded to this n. 28 minus 1, 27 is the degrees of freedom of the denominator. Continuing, here is the shape of the distribution. Using the applet on the bottom of the slide, you can adjust the degrees of freedoms of the numerator, the degrees of freedom of the denominator to see the shape of the distribution. So this gives you an idea of what an F2227 looks like. Generally speaking, if the test statistic is less than 1, it goes on the left side of the distribution. If the test statistic is more than 1, it goes on the right side of the distribution. You'll recognize that the F is a right tail test, like the chi-square. Shape's a little bit different, of course. And you can see the applet gives us the mean and variance of that F, as well as the quartiles, the tenth, excuse me, the percentiles, tenth percentile, twentieth percentile, etc. So here's what we have. We have our test statistic is 1.526. We have an F2227 distribution. It's a two-tailed test. So I want to find the area to the right of 1.526 and to the left of something. I don't know what that something is. I don't really care what that something is. But I just know I'm going to have to double that area to get the p-value. So how do we find the area to the right of 1.526? Well, the command end mini-tab is CDF 1.526 semicolon F2227. That will give us all of the area to the left 
and we're going to need to subtract that from 1 to get this piece. So we get 0.8526, and when I subtract that from 1, I get about 0.1475. So the part in this tail is about 0.1475. So since it's a two-tail test, the part in this tail is also 0.1475. And if I put those together, that will give me my p-value, 28, 29, more than uh, 29. So that certainly is a very high p-value. So we have our H0, our HA, our test statistic, and our p-value. And since the p-value is large, we fail to reject H0. So the likelihood of getting samples with variances this different just by random chance is 29%, which is high which means it is possible that what we assume to be true, that the variances are the same, indeed is reasonable. That doesn't mean it is true. It means we have to hold on to it as being tenable, being possible. So there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the two samples come from populations with different variances. They may be the same. We cannot be sure. Okay, let's take a look at one more example. Is there less variance in texting times for teens than for adults? So we looked at this data in an earlier lesson. And if we're going to use this data, we have to make sure that it comes from a normal distribution, and in particular, there cannot be any outliers. But looking at the data, we do indeed see an outlier in each. So if we're going to proceed using this data, we're going to need to remove it as saying that that outlier does not represent the population in general. So let's take a look at our sample. Here's our teen texting times to text that sentence. And you'll notice this one person is 91 seconds, almost 20 seconds or 18 seconds more than the one previous. So that is not representative of the entire sample. We're going to remove the 91.1. On the adults, it's even worse. We have a person who is 60 seconds more than the one before. So clearly the 195.6 is also an outlier. I don't feel too bad about removing them because I'm removing the highest from each group, so that seems to be a relatively fair thing to do. So indeed, we're going to remove the 91.1 from the teen sample and the 195.6 from the adult sample so that the samples we're going to use are going to go to 29 elements, 29 elements in the teen group and 29 elements in the over 30 group. Now we want to see if these data sets are normally distributed. So I'm going to use the norm test command on Minitab. We're going to put the teen data in C1. We are going to put the over 30 data in C2 and ask Minitab to run a norm test. So checking for normality, the command is going to be norm test C1. And you'll notice here, for teens, our p-value is 0.385. If the p-value is low, we reject normality. That p-value is not real high, but it's not low either. So it's reasonable for us to assume that this may have come from a normal distribution. Of course, this is a small sample size, so I do not have complete confidence that that's the case, because the p-value, generally speaking, will be large if we have a small sample size. So just a brief warning, it is possible that this may not have been normal, but we are going to assume it's normal due to the fact that the p-value here is large. Looking at the adults, I feel much better about the adult data set. That gives me a p-value of 0.937 very high p-value. I'm not going to reject normality. Again, it seems reasonable for us to assume that the adults come from a normal distributed population. Of course, we cannot be sure for certain because, again, our sample size is fairly small. So we're going to say since both sets pass the normality test, it may be fair for us to use the f-test for variances. So we have to establish our null and alternate hypotheses. Is there less variance in texting times for teens than for adults? So this sounds to me like it will be a one-tailed test. What the researcher wants to determine typically goes in the alternate hypothesis, HA. So we're going to say H0, the two variances are equal, versus HA, the variance for teens is less than the variance for adults. So here are the statistics using a modified version of the describe command on Minitab, our mean, our standard deviation, our variance, our count. So you'll notice that the sample standard deviation for teens is quite a bit less than the sample standard deviation for adults. But just because the samples behave the way we want them to doesn't tell us that the parameters will. We've got to make sure 
that this difference is more than just random chance. So f is s1 squared over s2 squared, 13.21 squared over 20.91 squared, which gives us 0 0.3991. Now we also need to establish the degrees of freedom of the numerator and the degrees of freedom of the denominator. So dfn, 29 minus 1, 28. And of course, dfd will be the same. dfd, 29 minus 1, also 28. So we want to find our p-value. Again, there's our h naught and our ha. There's our test statistic f, dfn, dfd. Notice here our f is less than 1, so we'll go on the left side of the graph, left side of the distribution. So we have an f2828. We have f is 0.3991, and that's probably an exaggerated position. We want to get the area to the left of 0.3991. So we ask many tabs, CDF, 0.3991, semicolon F, 28, 28. And what does it give me? It gives me 0 0.008926. So indeed, this is exaggerated. 0.3991 should be quite a bit further to the left. But that area in that tail is only 0 0.0089. So 0 0.0089 there, and that, of course, is a one-tail test. So our p-value will be 0 0.0089. So we have our H0 and our HA. We have our p-value. Our p-value is 0 0.0089. That is a small p-value. And what do we know? Since the p-value is small, we reject H0, which means assuming H0 were true, assuming the two samples came from populations with the same variance, the probability of getting numbers this different from each other in that direction just by random chance is 0 0.0089. And since that is so small, 0 0.0089 is so small, we say, you know what, maybe there is sufficient evidence to throw H0 out. Maybe we cannot assume that H0 could be true because the likelihood of getting numbers this extreme by random chance is so low. So maybe it wasn't just random chance. So our conclusion in context, we have sufficient evidence to conclude that the variance for texting times for teens is less than, is less for teens than for adults over 30. And that will conclude this presentation.